Praise the Lord, everybody. If we could stand in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm thankful we've made it here safely. I'm thankful we've, we're, we're making it through the cold. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I, I, I'm thankful to serve Jesus Christ. I'm thankful to know that name. I'm, I, I'm not rejoicing that the devils are subject, but I'm, I, I'm rejoicing that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I, I'm rejoicing in salvation. I'm rejoicing in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Will you just clap your hands with me tonight? Can we just praise Him a little bit tonight? I, I know some times have been tough. I, I know there's been some battles, but He's been faithful. When you've been weak, He hasn't changed. When you've been on the mountaintop, He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. I, I'm thankful for the work of the Spirit. I know the Spirit is working. I, I see it in the small groups. I see it in Bible studies. I see the Spirit moving in elements. I, I'm thankful for the growth. I'm thankful for the anointing in every service. And I just want to praise Him. I, I, I just want to praise Him tonight. I want to lift Him up for His faithfulness because He's been so good to me. He's blessed me. He's taken care of me. And I know His presence is here tonight. I know He's going to do something great tonight. It's a Wednesday night, but it, miracles are possible. It's a Wednesday night, but somebody getting the Holy Ghost is possible. It's Wednesday night, but families being restored are still possible. It's a Wednesday night, but, but a miracle for finances are possible. And when Jesus is here, truly anything is possible. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What I really want to do tonight, I want to pray for unity tonight. So if you feel like coming forward, feel free to come forward and pray with somebody. If you feel, if you feel comfortable with praying somebody next to you, pray with them. And if you've got any need in the house, you can, be, you can let it be made known by the raising of your hand. And our God will honor that. I believe things are going to happen tonight. I believe there's healing in this place. I believe that there can be a change of direction. I, pray, I believe that there can be clarity tonight. If you have just prayed with somebody, pray for unity. If you, need a, if you have a need, let it be known by the raising of your hand. And let's go to them tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your presence that's in this place. Lord, I know you're in this place. I feel you. I, I, I feel the anointing. God, I pray that you just begin to meet every need right now, every sickness. Lord, I pray that there's healing over diabetes, over lupus, over depression, over anxiety, over heart disease, over, over any brain, anything. Lord, I pray that there is healing in the name of Jesus. But Lord, I pray that we can have unity tonight. Lord, I pray that there will be a unity amongst every ministry between the preaching, the, the youth, the kids, the elements. Lord, I pray that there's an anointing and that we can align ourselves with your spirit, that there can be change. Lord, we want to be in alignment with you. There's power in alignment. There's change in alignment. But more than anything, Lord, help us to turn to you tonight. Lord, let us not just turn from everything in the world, but let us turn to you. The answer, Lord, you're, you're our life. You're our it's in you we have our being. We pray this in Jesus' name.
on, we need to praise him right now. We need to give him some high praise. Come on, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on, he can wash away your sins. It's only through his blood. In his blood we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. It was in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost was poured out and all those devout men that were gathered together, they said, how? How do we hear them speak in other tongues? The, the wonderful works of God. It, it was through the Spirit. It was through the how, only through the Spirit. When somebody gets filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, that's a miracle. It's a miracle that we can even receive His Spirit. It's only because of the work of the cross, only through His death. Only through his burial, only through his resurrection. If you're, if, there's miracles in this place. There's miracles in this place. You ain't seen no eyes open tonight, but there's people filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, active in ministry. There, there's people that's turned their lives around. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. just such a peaceful pre presence in here tonight. With, Je with Jesus, it will happen. Amen. If we could get our ways to give on the board. We have Giveify, PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We have pans for tithing and offering. And you can text to give at 833-883-9311. Amen. We're going to say this prayer with faith tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen.
present right now. Come on, lift up your voice in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for new life. I, I thank you, Lord, that you turned my life around. Lord, you've changed my message. No longer do I live for the world, but Lord, I live for you. My life is yours. My thoughts are yours. Every member of my body, Lord, it's for you. It's for your glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. We'll have Riverbend kids come forward. Amen. I'm thankful for our children. I'm thankful for our children's church teachers and what the Lord's doing through them and the growth that's happening in them. And I tell you what, they remember every word you teach them back there. They remember every single one of them. Several times I've been back there, Brother Richard, we get done and they repeat the whole lesson, everything we've taught. But let's stretch our hands forward and pray over them tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these children, Lord. I'm thankful for what they bring to the kingdom, Lord. Let us not underestimate it. Lord, forgive us for we've, what we've underestimated in them. But, Lord, I pray that you help the teachers tonight to really pour into them. I pray that there's a clear message. I pray that something will stick in the spirit, Lord, that will echo in their spirit for the rest of their lives, Lord, that will just pull on their heart and tug them into prayer and tug them into your word. God, I praise you. I lift you up because, Lord, truly anything is possible tonight. Anything is possible in that room back there. And I give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. All right, buddy Braxton, you can lead them on back. And we could have the River Bend Ignited come forward. I'm glad to see Brother Luke with us tonight. Amen. We got a good youth group. And I'm thankful for Brother Richard and Brother Tripp, our teachers. Let's pray for them with some faith tonight. They, I know we all battle stuff mentally. I know they battle stuff mentally. We need to cover them. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, there, there is a bright future for this group. Lord, there is, there is callings, there's anointings. Lord, and we're just declaring that in the name of Jesus. But Lord, I, most of all, Lord, I just want to pray a covering over their minds. And Lord, the distractions that are coming against them, the lies that are coming against their minds are saying they're no good. They can't do anything. We might as well give up. Or, or even the doubt, Lord, the enemy telling them this isn't real. I come against that in the name of Jesus. And I pray that there would be a Holy Ghost boldness get behind them, that there would be a witness of the Holy Ghost every time they pray, every time they witness, Lord, every time they get in your word, I pray that there would be faith rise up, God, I pray that there would be messages that are spoken into their spirit, Lord, that will change them forever, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, all right, Sister Chrislin, we're going to turn it over to Pastor, anybody feel like they're growing from the, I know I am. It's challenging me in the prayer room. It's challenging me in everyday life, but I'm thankful for it, and I'm thankful for our pastor. Amen. Thank you, Brother Blake. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I kind of got tickled a while ago. I looked out over the congregation, and we were just a few minutes in, and some of us was already about to hang it up. And uh, I kind of got tickled a little bit. We got several out tonight. Uh, we can't seem to whoop this sickness that's been going around. There's been three or four things that have been going around. We've had people with COVID and people with the flu, and people with stomach bug number one, two, or three, and strep throat, and, and lots of different things. So, uh, and uh, but uh, I want to tell you while they're handing the handout if. Uh, there's some cold weather coming, and uh, if something happens and you're struggling, reach out. Reach out. Text the church number. That'll get through. It, it eventually does. Those of you that text the church number, you just need to be aware. It may be a while because it comes through email, and uh, it's better just to text myself or my wife or somebody you know. Don't sit home. Be. It's going to get cold enough to get dangerous. So uh, don't, uh, don't uh, sit at home without reaching out. That's a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight, but indirectly. But it's good to see everybody that's here tonight. 
and uh, we've uh, uh, gonna gonna keep growing. Uh, last week, uh, um, well, several times this week, I've been reminded. Now, GL, you're gonna have to practice what you preach because it's a lot easier to preach than it is to live sometimes. And uh, but uh, I am putting it into motion, and uh, I, uh, I'm, I sometimes I'm scared to say stuff, but I, I really don't know why. <laughs> Because, in any way, but uh, I found out I was a whole lot more judgmental than I thought I was. Because we uh, we kind of put the the judgmental no nos in a little box, and long as I don't do them, but I mean we we mess around and judge total strangers. You know, I mean, so I, I'm I've been putting that up on a shelf somewhere and getting rid of it and getting past it. Don't be intimidated by the handout tonight because uh, uh, do we need a few more? Uh, it is long, but two things. <laughs> Unintentionally, I use bigger font, so that's one way to make it longer. I use 16 instead of 14, which I usually use. And the second thing is there's a lot of information there that I'm going to cover in a hurry. So don't don't worry about the handout being nearly two pages long. Uh, Brother Ronnie's getting some more handouts. and uh, One of these days, I'm going to figure out how to get it right every service. <laughs> People have to discover that God is for them and not against them. And, this is why I'm teaching this tonight, and that the people of God believe and feel just like he does. So I'm going to say that again. People must discover that God is for them and not against them. And that the people of God believe and feel just like he does. That's our responsibility to come into alignment with how he feels and how he thinks. Can I get an amen, amen. if you believe that? Yes. Dr. Henry Cloud, one of the authors that we're piling this conglomerated Bible study together from, shares this. He says, and I quote, I found myself in one of those times in life when a door has been slammed shut and I did not see another door open. I'm sure at some point we've all been there and it didn't feel good, but only because we think that God thinks like us. We think if it didn't happen, that means I'm supposed to kick the next door down, right? That's in the Bible, it's in your life, it's human nature, okay? The truth is, when we arrive at a place, and you remember the place is, I left one area of my life and the door shut. But the doors, next door is supposed to always open, but it didn't. Does anybody connect with what I'm saying here? You know, I, I, I thought I knew where I was going and I thought I knew what was happening. Thank you, I'm running a little behind on that tonight. But I thought I knew what was happening, but then that door behind me shut and I don't know what to do now. Truth of the matter is, when we arrive at such a place, we should feel blessed. It isn't that the door won't be opened. It is that we're being set up to learn what the grace of God really is. Because we have arrived at a place, a blessed place, a happy place, a godly place where we have come to the end of ourselves and now the stage is set for God to work. How many are comfortable not knowing where to go, what to do, what the next step is. Nah. No. But you have to get there 
in order to learn what God's trying to teach you right now. Many different things can drive us to this place, uh, circumstances in our life. Some of them we can control. Most of them we cannot. Some of them are on the outside. Some of them are on the inside. But who, who knows what's going on in our life that has driven us to this place. Relationships can drive us to this place. The first relationship, of course, is when you get married, uh, there's going to have to be some changes in your ministry. Right? If you knucklehead and think that you're going to get married and everything stay the same, surprise, surprise, surprise. And we, you know how I feel that God puts husbands and wives together for the betterment of the kingdom first. He don't put you with somebody to make you happy. He puts you with somebody you can do ministry with first. And then you become happy doing the will of God. We didn't like that too much, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Y'all been watching The Notebook too much. <laughs> or Sabrina or one of them old movies or something. When you get to a certain age, I know people don't like to talk about this, but let's get in the real world. When you get to a certain age, I was I don't see Dave here tonight. He thought he was going to get to come, but but when you get to it, Dave was telling me today about he likes to duck hunt, and uh, he said, I, I can't quite do it like I used to do it. Well, why? Because you're getting old, brother. I know we, we, we want to pretend like that's not happening, but guess what? If you're still breathing, it's happening. We get to a certain age, Brother Tenney said it like this, it's time for an old engine to find a new track. It's not time to quit. And if you live long enough, this is unavoidable, so get ready. And then there's one thing that will drive us. Y'all know where I'm talking about we're being driven to? Does anybody know? Can you tell me? Have I lost you already? Place where we're uncomfortable, place where we don't know what to do place where we don't have answers, where there is no open door. The one we're setting the stage for now is when God drives you there. Or perhaps better said, I'm hungry for it. Meaning that I want more of God. I'm hungry. I have found a holy dissatisfaction in my life and now I'm having to move to another deal. In the Bible, the example of that that you might read is the Lord sent Elijah to be by a brook. And he was going to drink out of the brook and the birds were going to feed him. But you know what the Bible says? And it came to pass, the brook dried up. You know what that means? Time to move on. So many different things can happen in your life. And, and I, I hope you notice circumstances, relationships, age getting on us, and God driving us there, really all of those could be included in God did it. Okay? So the Lord is moving to get us there. I know it's a slow coming out of the gate, but trust me, it, it'll get going a little bit. When we find ourselves in this place, in addition to the doors all being closed, it often also includes the Lord don't sound like he's talking to us either. So I don't hear the Lord. I don't see where to go. So what do I do then? Does anybody know? When you don't know what to do, when you don't know what to say, and now there's going to be like 51 people say, man, you got to start praying. I don't know about you all, but when Brother David, when I get to these kind of places, I, I want to pray. I try to pray. But it gets about that from, from about here to right there. That's how it feels. And we're not supposed to talk about that because remember, we're supposed to pretend that when you get the Holy Ghost, you got a direct line to heaven all the time. You know that when you say, God is good, God is great, you start, woo! That's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Well, the truth of the matter is, it don't work like that, Brother Christian. I don't feel God every time I pray. But that don't mean I stop praying. Because I don't pray because I feel him. I pray because I believe in him. 
I have faith, but what should you do? Write this on your paper, write it down, put a tattoo of it across your chest, I don't care, don't forget it. What do you do when you can't pray, you don't know where to go, you, nobody's listening and the Lord's not speaking? What do you do? Go to the Word. I'm not telling you something that's just evangelistic. I'm telling you something that saved my life. The Lord spoke to me through his word. I heard him. I was encouraged, and nothing in my life changed. <clears throat> but we turn to the word of God. I want to tell you, fall in love with the word of God. And the truth is, Brother Shannon, when we turn to the word of God, we are, in fact, doing nothing, you know. We're, we're turning to the word of the Lord because we want to hear from him, okay? But trust me when I tell you, God has put you in this place to teach you something. So let's turn to the word of God. It's a pretty novel concept because it takes patience. I can't tell you how many times, I don't really know how many times people have called me and they said, I'm, I'm reading, trying to hear from the Lord, and I ain't heard from him. It don't make no sense. Well, how long have you been reading? Five minutes. All right, that's a little bit hyperbole, and that's a little bit, you know, uh, uh, for, for uh, explanation purposes. But going to the Word of God means you have pushed the wait button. It involves an awareness that we are crossing a bridge from one season to another, and we're doing it in the dark. It's a microcosm of what your life is going to look like from now on. God is setting you up for what's next, and we have to trust him. Going to the word of God is always applicable, and the answer is always there. It may just have to be mined from the depths of God revealing himself and his plan for us, and he might do it one word at a time. The psalmist said, I wish I could preach right now. I would just take like a five-minute time out and preach. The psalmist said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What better time than to, lo to lose ourselves in truth than when we don't know what to do, when we don't have an answer, when we don't have a direction. You see, there's a blessing when you don't... God, I feel the Holy Ghost starting to move now. When you come out of a season and now you don't know what to do, here's how you got to look at it. Clean slate. Start over. When we don't know where to go, the slate is clean because the past is behind us and we don't know what's next. So we, through the word, get prepared for what God is fixing to say to us. When Dr. Cloud found himself in this condition, you, you can read the book if you have it, but the truth of the matter is he was a Division I college golfer and uh, he was on line to be a professional golfer. And Brother Terrence, he got tendon damage in his hand, a degenerative, a degenerative disease. And guess what? He can't do no more. He can't play golf no more. That's what he was going to college, everything. His whole life was set up for that. Man, I feel Jesus in the house. And something happened and severed his plans, and he doesn't know what to do. So he went to the word of God, and he came to the scripture. We talked about it last week, Matthew 6, 33 and 34. But seek ye first, everybody say first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everybody say his righteousness. One of the things I want to do tonight is I want to deliver us into a place where we seek the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and stop uh, stop buying billboards for our own. Excuse me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things and all these things shall be added unto you. What are these things? Where to go, what to do. Answers from God, right? He's going to speak to me. He's going to tell me what to do. Everything I need Everything I need shall be added unto me. Then he says in verse 34 in the New Living Translation, 
So don't worry about tomorrow. Let me tell you something. I am in the process of being delivered from worrying. Matter of fact, I, Brother Shannon, have had to remind myself to worry. Some of y'all need to drink some of what I'm drinking. The Bible says don't worry about tomorrow. Matter of fact, it says don't worry about anything. I got a revelation yesterday. Worrying has never helped, fixed, blessed, nothing. Worrying is the biggest waste of time, effort, and energy any human being can do. So don't worry about tomorrow, the Bible says. Excuse me, the Bible says, for tomorrow will bring its own set of worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's come into reality. Dr. Cloud began to read this passage, and here's what he asked himself. Now, those are about to blow your mind how profound this is. He asked himself, is it true? that if I seek the Lord, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, that all these things will be given unto me? Is it true? Question I have to ask you is what you got to lose. The conclusion that Henry Cloud came to is one we're gonna have to come to as well. You know what he said? I believe I'm gonna try it. I believe I'm going to try to seek after the Lord, the kingdom of God, and I'm going to see if the word is true. He didn't know. I'm not going to ask us if we know. But he didn't have a clue what it meant to seek the Lord. He didn't even really know what the Lord's righteousness was. So he did the most logical thing that a human could do that knows nothing but wants to. He went to church. And when he went to church, he prayed. I wish I had somebody to give me a drum roll right now because what I'm about to say is so powerful. He made up his mind to obey the word of God. He found a church. He didn't look for which. He just found a church and he prayed and said, Lord, if that's true, I want it. And guess what happened? Nothing. It's true. Nothing. He didn't hear from God. He didn't feel any direction. He didn't hear anything from the Lord. But it didn't matter that he didn't hear nothing. Because I feel Jesus. Come on, get, help me right now, Holy Ghost. I need you. Because his decision wasn't circumstantial based. And it wasn't emotional based, but it was built on the reality that I don't have the answers. I don't have what I need. And the Bible said God does. So I'm in it to win it. There was a reality in his life that he was at a crossroads that if God doesn't do it, then I don't have any other options. I have made up my mind to seek after God because he's the only hope I have of finding the answers that I need for my life. I would venture to say that we could write an encyclopedia from the experiences and, and the, the poor decisions that have been made by this blessed congregation of believers. When we moved and we didn't have direction, when we made decisions that were not built upon the word of God and the power of God. Henry Cloud had came to a place where there was nothing else. All, all his hope was in that the word of God was true.
I just felt something in the Holy Ghost. I don't know how many of us have ever even been there. Because there's always been an option. The Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm about to do some teaching if the Lord will help me. Because we don't, we don't really know if we want to buy what I'm selling tonight. Because I'm kind of smart. And I'm kind of anointed and I'm kind of gifted and I'm kind of blessed. And if nothing else, I've hung around here long enough to pick up a few things. What are you, what are you talking about? I know what he's talking about. He's talking about all them sinners that show up to church. Let me tell you something. If you're here today and you classify yourself as one of them sinners that shows up to church, enjoy yourself, but I ain't talking to you tonight. I'm talking to people who believe they got it all together. I'm talking to people who think I'm wasting my breath in teaching these things. They just keep coming and showing up because I'm telling you right now, until you get to the end of yourself, you will not see him at his fullest. Impossible. Mm. Sometime after he prayed, here's where y'all said he got the answer. Sometime after he prayed, he was in his room. Now see if this ain't the, the wisdom of God versus the foolishness of men. A fraternity brother called him. Now as soon as I read fraternity brother, I know what I'm thinking. Party, party, party. Yeah, he invited him to a party, all right. He said, this is really weird. But we're starting up a Bible study, and I felt like I'm supposed to invite you. He said, I'll be there. He went to the Bible study, and he heard the word, and it said the same thing to him that he had found on his own and he believed it. The most powerful truth he learned was that seeking God and his righteousness was not something that was going to happen quickly. It was not something somebody was going to lay hands on him and it be fixed. It was not something that he could come three services in a row and it would happen, but it was going to be a long process. The first step, is everybody with me all right? The first step in the process, now I know what this is about to come back on me, but I've been praying for you. I've been praying for all of y'all that don't need this. The first, I, I'm not being funny, I'm being for real. You know, Brother Christian, I am not worried about new worshipers because I'm going to preach this and I'm going to teach this enough that they're going to get it. I'm worried about people who don't know they need it yet. Just file that away in your member bank because it's coming. Because we get to a place where we feel entitled to this. We get to a place, if we're not careful, where we have more in common with the Pharisees and the Sadducees than we do with Jesus, C-H-R-I-S-T. Look here. The first step now, this is going to be powerful again. The first step in the process is we have to get a true understanding and view of who God really is. Because if we're going to become like him, we better find out who he really is and what he's really like. Now, this is Holy Ghost right now. Got it straight from heaven. A barometer of where I stand with God is how I view him. If I view him as harsh, judgmental, ready to damn and ready to condemn, the barometer is that's how I will also treat other people. Because I will treat them like I think of him. But that's not who he is. I said, that's not who he is. Listen to this. Man, this is powerful. 
It is unnatural for us to see God as he truly is. You cannot see him as he truly is from a natural perspective. Because the things of God are stupid to a natural perspective. Our nature, I already know who's going to say this ain't true about them. There's about three or four of you. Well, you're about to be surprised. Our nature is competitive and performance-based. And we nurture that and we validate that in our children nearly from the time they're born. Say, I don't know if that's true. Well, let me just tell you it's true. When did they say their first word? When did they take their first step? When did they hold a spoon and a fork alone? You know why we keep track of that stuff? To measure our kids up among the other kids. Now look here. If they are ahead of their mother toe heads, we're going to crow about how great ours is. But if they're behind them, we're going to make excuses of why that's how it is. Y'all, y'all, you're sitting back there crossing your legs and stuff while the preaching's going on. And you say, little Susie Q said her first word today at six months, three weeks, 12 hours and 47 minutes. Has your little dumb baby said anything yet? You didn't say that, but that's what you were thinking. Because I know mine's a genius. Uh, Y'all know I'm telling the truth right now. From the time they come out, we're putting them up against everybody else. Oh, come on now. Come on now. You think, why do you think when they get in Little League that all the parents is up in the stands, and I've been one of them before, till I realize what a fool I look like, up in the stands, boy, catch that ball. We practiced, we practiced that 14 hours yesterday. Catch that ball. As if the fact that they didn't catch the ball looks bad on us. Huh? Because we want everybody to know that we're the number one daddy in the whole wide world. And I work with my kid even though he ain't no good. Now think, I know this is, is kind of funny, but that's the stuff we embed in our children from the time they're little bitty that life's a competition. That is against Jesus Christ. I, I mean, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings and stuff, but that's against the way the Lord does things. He doesn't operate in competition. He doesn't operate. I know this is going to mess with us. He doesn't operate in performance. You will never get a sticker from Jesus. You will never get a tip from him. God doesn't roll like that. He came to be our sacrificial lamb and save people from their sins. But he came for another reason. Have you ever thought about what the other reason Jesus came for? He came to seek and save that which was lost. But what's the other reason Jesus came? Anybody have any ideas? Take a shot in the dark. You might be right. Somebody said something. Say it again. Oh, to work through us, that's a pretty good idea, but it ain't right. No, I'm just Let me tell you why he came. So we could know God. That's why he came. No man has seen God at any time. 
Jesus, the Son of God, hath declared him. Yes, ma'am. You want to ask a question or something? Do what now? Oh, that's right. We're about to learn about that. Absolutely. But we're about to learn about that. We're about to learn how that happens. He came to restore what was broken. Sure. That, that was a good answer. But he came. Do you all understand what I mean? He came so we would know God. Because before Jesus Christ came, we didn't really connect with God. Say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, Isaiah prophesied it. And the angel confirmed it when it says, you'll bring forth the son and call his name. That's the first one. The second one is call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay. All right. I think I jumped ahead, but that's all right. No, I'm good. That's how we got to know God is through Jesus Christ. Look at this, John 14 and 8. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Let me tell you what I wrote down in my notes right there. Who do you think you are, Jack? Show us the Father and it'll suffice us. It'll be sufficient for us. We'll be satisfied then if you show us the Father. Why did he say show us the Father? What was missing in Philip and the disciples' life that Jesus wasn't enough. Why did they need to see the Father and then they'll be satisfied? Any ideas? Good. I'm going to tell you why. Because it was a competition. And the competition was between the Jews and the Romans. And, and Jesus was going around healing people being nice to weird people, loving on sick people, raising the dead, healing the sick. He welcomed the prostitutes and he welcomed the, the hoochie mamas and he welcomed all this other stuff. And they needed the father to come down and be what they needed him to be, which was what? The big man on campus. They needed the father to come down and be a conquering warrior and a conquering hero. They needed him to come. All this kind of cute little stuff that Jesus was doing and the way he was saying everybody can come to me and everybody can be a part of me violated what they wanted, which was what? What did the disciples want? To be the best. Think about it. How many times did they argue about it? James and John's mama even come to Jesus and said, hey, in, in the resurrection, since my boys both talked at three months and walked at six months, I'm being silly, but can one of them sit on the right and one of them sit on the left and all them other buzzards just find a place? Think about how much their mind was on the performance. You see where I'm going here? Their mind was on performance. And so Philip says, show us a father and we'll be happy then. Jesus said, what's wrong with you? Have I been, oh Lord, have I been so long time with you and you don't know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Yeah. 
They had a human perspective of who they expected God to be and Jesus wasn't fulfilling that. He was not living up to what they expected out of a Messiah. Even though he was the Messiah. And this is a powerful one statement. Another one wasn't coming. So two things can happen when they find out, well, Jesus is God. First thing is what? The first thing is leave. Why? This ain't cutting it. Don't like this. I was expecting more than this. I was expecting some validation. I was expecting some victory. I was expecting a seat at the head table, not down here washing people's feet and stuff. What's wrong with you? That's the first option. The second option was, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Don't nobody heal like him. Don't nobody speak with authority like him. Nobody does miracles like him. Nobody, nobody. You know what? I think we might have been missing out. I think there might be some more we need to know. Sorry about that, Lord. We got too big for our britches. We forgot where we were. Move on because it ain't working or else say, I believe I'm hungry for more. You see, there must be a shift. The disciples had to have it, and so do we have to have it. What is that shift? From a natural human view of God to a biblical view of God. We got to move from a traditional view of God to a biblical view of God. And the first step in this is to be delivered from serving a God of the law and begin serving a God of grace. When you serve a God of the law, you're tied to a checklist. When you serve a God of grace, you're tied to a purpose that's bigger than you. For most believers, if you ask them about grace, they think about it in context of John Newton, which is amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Brother David, the definition of grace really has nothing to do with saving you from your sins. The definition of grace is favor, particularly the unmerited favor of God or the undeserved favor of God. That's not how grace is defined. Grace is not just about when I'm bad, I get better. It's favor. Favor says God is for me, not against me. Favor cannot be earned. Here we go. Favor gives us things we cannot give ourselves and leads us to places we cannot find on our own. Grace, in particular the concept of favor, undergirds the entire growth process. This is why recovery works is we have to have a source for the things we need that's bigger than us. And who looks upon us with favor and the things he gives us are for our own good. Not because we feel like that's what we want. When we think and live under the mentality, Brother Larry, I'm glad you're out here tonight, brother. If you'd had to go back with the kids tonight, I was probably going to overrule it. Based on some conversations me and you have had. Y'all stay with me right now. When we think and live under the mentality of God that is law, 
We have to earn what we need and receive from God through a good performance. I said we have to earn it. Uh, Y'all come too late to tell me I ain't teaching the truth right now. I have prayed. I've told you this before. I'll probably tell you again. I have prayed this prayer. Lord, I know I was a fool. But if you give me one more chance, I'll prove to you that I'll be what you want me to be. As if I have that power. Look here. When we think and live under the mentality of God that is law, we have to earn what we need and receive from God through a good performance. Whatever is happening in our life is basically what we've deserved or earned. And we have to be afraid of God because any minute we're going to mess up and he's going to drop us. God is angry and upset with me and I have to do whatever I need to do to survive including save myself. When we have a law mentality, this is how we respond when we fail. We say things like, I know I failed and I know that I've sinned and I know that God is displeased with me and I feel terrible. I'm such a sinner. I'm such a loser. I'm going to ask God for forgiveness and then next time I'm going to do better. I'm really going to commit I know I've done bad, and I promise if you give me another chance, I will do better. When we feel God's angry with us, we wallow in guilt and shame. We don't even consider that God is for us and ready to loose grace in our lives. Our solution is always, I will try harder, and then I'll get it right. And that attitude is always doomed for failure because grace isn't working, I am. God is not, I want you to hear this, God is not as interested in getting his way as he is in us being healthy and whole. You believe that? Do you believe that? I didn't like living for God, scared of him. I didn't like living for God like I was walking on eggshells. And any little mistake I made, there was going to be a double barrel shotgun from heaven blow me away. I didn't like that. It didn't feel right to me. It didn't feel normal to me. And, and I didn't see that in him. The truth is, that's something I learned from other people. Not from the Bible, not from the Lord, not from the example that Jesus gave. I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying right now. Because in John chapter number four, he showed up in Samaria and the book says he must needs go through Samaria it was a plan of God. That girl never asked for help. She never repented. She never, there's no record that she was fasting and praying and reading her Bible and going to church. She was ashamed and she was degraded and she was embarrassed because, ah, because that's how people do you. That's how people do you. But she came up to the well and she said from the jump, you can't talk to me. You're a Jew, I'm Samaritan. Y'all don't have nothing to do with the likes of me. And Jesus said, can I have a drink? Then she said, that's, he said, can I have a drink? She said, what you doing talking to me? What's gonna happen when we start being like Jesus? We're gonna change the world. We're gonna change the world. Oh, I feel Jesus in the house right now. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost because I'm going to learn to be like him and stop being like them, whoever them is, because it ain't right. That's not who he is, Sister Crystal. That's not who he is. 
He came to the well to meet a trashy woman on purpose for her. I'm telling you right now, he knew who he was coming to meet. He knew she had been married five times and was shacking up with number six. And he came to see her anyway. And it was against the law, Brother Christian. But he was marching to the beat of a drummer that nobody down there in here hears. God, help me. I need you to help me. The Lord isn't bringing to us or nor is he operating out of condemnation and damnation, but he's waiting on us. Now, I got to tell you this. I, I was telling some of them earlier. You can't lay down by grace and it work for you. You can't just go over in the corner somewhere and lay down by the grace of God and say, you know, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya and everything get all right. Nor does grace work by osmosis. It don't just seep into you when you hang around somebody that's full of the Holy Ghost and acts like Jesus. You know how you get grace? You ask for it. You reach out. That's why the concept of recovery is so powerful. I read this. I haven't got to this in the big book, but Henry Cloud references it. That they, He said, the people at the AA meetings have had some principles of the Bible right when the church wasn't getting them right. Because they say run to grace. We say if you be bad, stay away and don't embarrass us. Huh? But Brother Blake, we're growing and we're changing. And we're in a season of sowing. Look here, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly. How do you do that? Let me tell you how we've always done it. When I prayed enough, read enough, fasted enough, and feel like I measured up enough, then I would come and say, I come boldly. You know what was happening right then, Brother Christian? The Lord was monkey seeing and monkey doing on me. He ain't listening to that. He ain't interested in me coming to him, trumpeting my accomplishments and my abilities, coming in bold. Where did you think that boldness came from? I guarantee you most of us thought that we could come boldly because we now were good. How does that compute? That it says, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may find mercy to help in a time of need. I'm not coming boldly because I'm good. I'm coming boldly because I need him. That's what gives us that boldness is because we've come to the end of ourselves. I got nothing to offer him. I'm not smart. I'm not good looking. I'm not rich. I'm not talented. I am nothing. And he says, come on, boy. That's when we come boldly. You come boldly when you come with nothing. Because you know what's going to happen when I bring my stuff to you know what's going to happen when I bring my stuff to his throne room? Let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to pack my junk up and run out of there ashamed and embarrassed. Oh, Lord, help me. My voice is about to go. My voice is about to go over the clock one. Yes, ma'am. So what you're saying is your failure was the pathway 
to you experiencing something from God that you wouldn't have experienced otherwise. Because without our failure, Brother Shannon, we feel like we've earned it somehow. We feel like we've deserved it. That's why they're going to come to him in the last day, Brother Johnny, and they're going to say, wait a minute. We cast out devils in your name. We healed the sick in your name. We did all these other things in your name. And what's he going to say, Brother Jerry? Depart from me. I never knew you. Why did, ooh, help me, Holy Ghost. Why did he never know me? You know why? Because I never needed him. Because I got this. It's the way of the world. It's the world that we live in. Oh, the Holy Ghost is moving in this house tonight. He started his sermon on the mount. Most famous message Jesus preached. He started it. His first verse was, blessed are the poor in spirit. What's that mean, Brother David? Abundant happiness. Right out of the gate. But are the poor in spirit. You know what that says in other versions? Happy are they that, happy are they that know they need him. Then he takes it a step further. You led me right to this, Sister Stacy. You just lobbed it up there, and I'm about to smoke it. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 and 10, maybe 11, I don't know. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Listen to this. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. But don't nobody want to be weak. It's a shame to be weak. It's embarrassing to be weak. I got to be a strong man. I got to be a strong woman. But the Lord said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Look here. Here you go, Sister Stacy. It's your scripture. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know what he's saying? I wouldn't have this power if I didn't have this weakness. All right, let me move on. Let me move on. Look here. The only revelation that we need is to come to the end of myself. To experience the freedom of giving up the need to perform and to just focus on one thing, Jesus Christ and his righteousness. You see, help will always come. I, 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 you guys might want to study this and get ready for it. Let me tell you something. I feel like one of the reasons why, Sister Stephanie, you better listen to this, because you got a feeling from the Lord. Let me tell you why we don't see more miracle signs and wonders. It's because we're not still sure who's doing it. We like it to be us when we go lay hands on people. We, matter of fact, like to express our spirituality by going and laying hands on people. You better be careful about that. You better be careful about that. Daddy was laying on the couch hurting really, really bad one night. And he said, son, pray for me. Which I'm telling you right now, never been that scared in my life. And I put my hand here because that was my daddy. And my hand didn't have no business on his head. That's what I felt. And he grabbed my hand, Brother Johnny, and he moved it over on his head. And that's one of the most humbling moments I've ever had in my life. Brother McKinney asked me to pray for him many times, and to my knowledge, I never once laid my head on his, my hand on his head. I said, well, why not? Because it's a respect thing. And I know good and well I didn't deserve to be laying hands on the head of either one of them men. I don't know why I'm saying that, but I felt it in the Holy Ghost. Be careful. But when you come to the end of yourself, 
Ain't nobody going to question if you lay hands on folks because they ain't going to be looking at you. They're going to be looking at the miracle. Come and go with me real quick to the schoolhouse of grace. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Because I know some of y'all was thinking, oh, here you go, preaching that old gracey, gracey stuff. That means we can do whatever we want. I would argue with you that grace is much more demanding than the law ever was. Because, Brother Cody, in the law, when we're talking about the law, I got to talk about my performance. It was the only way I was measured. Huh? Oh. Mm. Man, I feel Jesus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Look at here. Teaching us. And, and I, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I'm telling you right now, that ain't the teaching like they do at school nowadays. That's old school teaching. It involved whooping. Look it up. It's in the Bible. It involved whooping. It didn't involve time out. It involved go get you a switch off the tree, boy. It involved harsh discipline. It was demanding teaching. You know what demanding teaching does? Teaches you a whole lot of things. I know Sister Crystal's a teacher, but they it's a different world. It ain't got nothing to do with you. And some more of y'all's teachers. Yeah, some, some more of you are. This ain't got nothing to do with you. This is just old school teaching. And you beat the brakes off of somebody if they didn't do good. If they talked bad, said a cuss word, a cuss word. Got your mouth washed out with soap. That happened in Head Start when I was there. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, some of you. My teacher's name was Miss Mann, and you said a bad word, you got your mouth washed out with soap. Y'all be calling the police on the teacher did that now. But that's, a, that's the kind of teaching that word means. Teaching us that, oh my Lord, I got to quit, but I'm telling you, this is so powerful. Brother Blake, here we go. If the Lord don't want me to do that, let him tell me he don't want me to do that. If the Lord don't want me to do that, I'll get a sign from heaven that he don't want me to do that. If the Lord don't want you to do that, then you deny it because he said don't do it. He will never make you not do it because the teaching is denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That's my job. When he teaches it, I got to do it. I got to learn something. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Ladies and gentlemen, did you see that's not a work of the Spirit? That's what grace teaches you. But you know how grace teaches you that, Sister Stacy. It gives you room to do it wrong the first time. And then you have the confidence to come to the body and get it right the next time rather than get kicked out. Or better yet, to be fair, I never knew nobody got kicked out. They just avoided because they was ashamed. I, I'm, I'm bringing her home, I promise We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So even with the right intentions, this convicted me. We'll ask somebody, are you doing right? Are you living right? Then we tell them when they say no, we tell them, well, you haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much. We forgive you and the Lord will forgive you. Then we tell them, just work harder. You'll get it right next time. That's not how grace works. The first message of grace is, all right, you failed, but you're not a failure. 
you did fail, but you're not a failure. I don't identify you. Then we tell them you can't get better by trying harder or doing more or increasing your performance. So just stop and take a breath. The performance train has left the station. Let me tell you why we have such a problem with that is some of us have no relationship with God beyond that. Then, we're happy to tell you we don't have all the answers. But we can give you directions and find resources where you can get the things that you can't get yourself. These steps will establish a ministry of growth and grace. Number one, tell it, yell it, and then do it again. God is not your enemy. He's for you. He's not out to get you. The Lord, I've used this illustration before. The Lord is not a sanctimonious tattletale that lets all the kids at school go out to the back and hides and peeks at them around the corner so he can go tell on them. We think he's like that. He ain't. Lord ain't got time to play games like that. God's not your enemy. He's for you. He wants you to get it right. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be a blessing. He's got a plan for you. And then we teach this, these steps. God's not your enemy. He's for you. Number two, God is not mad at you for failing. God is not mad at you for failing. But I, I was hoping somebody would remember what I preached a few weeks ago. Because if he does get mad at you, What's the Bible say? Not for long. Because the book says his anger endureth but for a moment. God's not mad at you. He's got a vested interest in you making it. He's not happy when you fail. So don't avoid him. Don't run from him. Run to him. Run to grace. It is a safe place. And there are things you need that can only come from God. You will not find them from somebody else. And he died so that you would have access to those things you need. Reach out, ask for help, and you'll find it. Because he that seeketh, findeth. He that asketh shall receive. He that seeketh findeth. He that knocketh, it shall be opened unto him. Yep, Janaea, he came for the broken. He came for the broken. And his pathway is not pressure from people. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. Give up. Surrender. Because you got a promise. And when you got a promise, what should you do? I'm going to give you a pass because you wasn't at church Sunday. Build an altar. Come on, folks. Stand with me. I hope we've given you something to go home with. If you find yourself saying things to people that are characteristics of the law, stop. And let's learn to talk like grace. We want the same thing. We want people to come and be holy, live holy, and, and grow in the Lord and fulfill his purpose. We ain't never manipulated nobody there. We never browbeat nobody there. We never shamed nobody there. I will arise and go back to my father. That better be the spirit 
in the hog pen. Because at any time I get ready, I can go home. Say, well, I don't think, let me tell you something. If there ain't but one that can decide somebody can't come home, you know who that is? That's the Lord. We don't get that option. God, I love you tonight. I thank you for your word, for truth, the power of the Holy Ghost. I thank you that you are wanting us to grow, that you're wanting us to learn to be more like you and less like us. Forgive us, Lord, for all the things that we, we just, we were ignorant. Paul said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Lord, I, I thought I had to be good enough. I thought I had to measure up. I thought I had to perform satisfactorily in order to be accepted by you. I thank you for teaching me that I didn't. And I don't have to be ashamed when you bless me and I'm not all together. I don't have to think it's the flesh. I just have to understand that your grace is bigger than my mess-ups and my failures. And you're pulling me and you're calling me and you're bringing me to where you want me to be. <coughs> In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 10 o'clock Sunday, 11 o'clock worship, 10 o'clock bring your book. Love you, God bless you, you're dismissed.